When you have your girls, you're never alone. You get together for coffee, maybe to work out, or just to laugh. We created Hey Girl, just for you. Can't wait for you to join us. Hey everybody, welcome to Hey Girl. I'm your girl, Kim with an E, and this is episode 97. If you're joining us for the first time, wanna let you know that Hey Girl is a safe space where you can share your experience and be affirmed. Let's face it, life can be complex and sometimes overwhelming. That's why we believe in the power of conversation because knowing we're not alone is what will help us get through. So I'm glad that you are joining us today. Please say hello in the comments. Tell me where you're joining from and go ahead and like and follow the Hey Girl page and share today's live with all of your friends. Guys, we have moved into a brand new month and we have a brand new theme, which I am so excited about. Now, last month we were celebrate, celebrating um, Black History Month and of course, Black Girl Magic. This month we are moving into Women's History Month and focusing on woman, womanhood in particular, um, or more broadly, I guess. Last month it was more about Black Girl Magic. This month it's about womanhood in general um, and ex and ex the experiences of women. So I want all of you to get ready for every week of this month because it's going to be very unique for you as a woman. But today, especially, you're gonna want to sit back and enjoy this conversation. We are spilling tea and talking about topics that matter to us, especially those things that we don't usually talk about. <laughs> And today's guest is definitely going to be sharing information about that. Um, so it's all about it's all the things that our moms never told us or never taught us. That's what this month is about. So go ahead and grab your girlfriend and grab a cup of tea because this is going to be a great show. And this whole month is just going to be all about us. Now, I have a question. For those of you out there, can you think of something you had to learn on your own because your mother wasn't able or willing to talk to you about it? Go ahead and put that in the comments and let me know what some of those topics were that you kind of had to figure out along the way. Um, say hello in the comments also and let me know that you're here. Uh, I have a few announcements. I want to let you know that we have a brand new desktop calendar for you if you sign up to our newsletter. Look how cute that is. I'm sure you're going to want to get your hands on that. So just sign up for the Just Kim newsletter. It, I will send you once a week some motivation, free downloads, and tips and news about what's coming up. And of course, each month I give you a beautiful calendar for your desktop wallpaper. So go ahead and sign up. You may also want to sign up this month in particular, because as you know, we are counting down to our 100th episode. Oh my goodness. I don't know how we got to it. It's amazing. It's amazing. Time flies when you're having fun, I tell you. So we are working on something special to celebrate the 100th episode. And we're connecting it to uh, the book. Of course, I hope that you have gotten your hands on this already. If not, it's not too late, of course. Go to Amazon.com. You can get the ebook or the hard copy. And to celebrate our 
100th episode, I will be giving away a free copy, but you have to sign up for the newsletter to get the details on how you can sign up or get your name in the drawing. And then we're going to be um, doing something special around the book once you sign up for the drawing. And I will let you know more about that as details become available. But in the next few weeks, we're gonna be gearing up for the 100th episode celebration. And I hope that all of you will be here with me for that. All right, so be sure to share today's live. I am thrilled to introduce you to my guest for today. Her name is Dr. Janelle Howell, and she's from Huntsville, Alabama. Went to Oakwood Academy from grade school to college, um, completed a BS in pre-physical therapy at Oakwood University in 2013. Two years later, she completed a doctorate from the University of the Pacific in 2015. In 2017, she transitioned into women's health physical therapy, completing a residency at Loyola University Medical Center in Chicago for women's physical therapy. She then became a board certified specialist in women's health physical therapy in 2020. Currently, she practices as a pelvic physical therapist at Northwestern Hospital in Chicago and is affectionately known on Instagram and TikTok as the Vagina Rehab Doctor. Janelle is passionate about teaching women how to build a culture of radical education surrounding their intimate health and spiritual health so they can be empowered to live a life they love. So if you would please welcome with me, Dr. Janelle Howell to Hey Girl. Hello, Kim. Hello, everybody. Hey. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so glad to have you. And wow, I am super interested in what you have to share with us today. I feel like you have such a unique uh, specialty that is so appropriate for our theme this month. And I can't wait to get into it. Um, but before we do, I would love for you to share with us a little bit <clears throat> about your background. So I know you're from Huntsville and um, I'm sure many people who are watching today know who you are, but for those who don't, tell us about your parents. Do you have siblings? Um, anything sure. about your background that people yeah. may not know? <laughs> yeah. So my mom is actually a Spanish teacher in Huntsville. at, at um, I think they call it Jemison High School now. I want to say Johnson, but she's a right. Spanish teacher and she's from Panama. So technically I am Afro-Latina because my mom is Panamanian. Mm -hmm. um, my dad is, is um, John, that's his name, and he's a, a personal trainer. Um, and I love my dad very much. He's a big motivator for me. Of course, I love my mom too. That goes without saying. <laughs> and my mm -hmm. brother is a nurse, uh, a travel nurse. So I grew up in Huntsville, went to Oakwood Academy from kindergarten all the way up to college. Um, I majored in pre-physical therapy at Oakwood. And then I went on to get my doctorate in physical therapy from the University of the Pacific. Um, and so that's where I got my education. I love traveling. I love um, public speaking and just enjoying my friends and my family. That's, awesome. a, that's a little bit about me without getting too much into, you know, what we're going to be talking about today. Right, right, for sure. So I want to back up a little bit to the family dynamic. Um, you talked about your relationship with your mom and dad. And I'm curious to know, what, how would you characterize your relationship with your mom? Would you say that you all are close? Are you more of a daddy's girl? Um, I would say growing up, I thought I was a daddy's girl because I just love to get piggyback rides and hug my dad and just be close to my dad. <laughs> but now I would say I'm really extremely close to my mom. I feel comfortable talking to her about just about anything. I tell my friends different things and I tell my mom and they're like, you told your mom that? And I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know why not. <laughs> so yeah. I would say my mom is a friend. She's, she's, I would say she's my friend more than she's like, oh my gosh my mother figure. We travel a lot yeah. together. Um, she's definitely my biggest support system. And, you know, I look up to her a lot in, in various different ways. So I love that woman. That's <laughs> awesome. I love that. That's so good. So uh, it sounds like 
you definitely have developed an appreciation for your mom and your relationship with her as you as you got older. Are there any life lessons that she taught you growing up that particularly stand out? Well, she told me to always smile. <laughs> that was her <laughs> biggest thing. Like, if you are having a bad day, just smile <laughs> and oh, drink wow. your water. Like, my mom was big on drinking your water, smiling, um, <laughs> and always dreaming big. That was one thing for our mom. Is she always tells me that my dreams should should scare me, you know. Um, mm. And my dad as well. That's something that they taught me. Like, shoot for the top. Like, make your mm. goals and your dreams big and then get to work to accomplish it. So um, mm. that's something that my mom definitely taught me. And also to be involved, you know, not to be someone who just sits around, but to get mm. involved in whether that's at church or at school, your community with your friends, be a leader mm -hmm. and, and get things going. Don't sit around complaining. So that, that yeah. I was, I definitely learned from my mom. I know your mom and that sounds, that sounds very in, in line with what I know of her. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm not surprised at all. Um, so what would you say was, it was that influenced you most into going into physical therapy in particular? Uh, was it your parents? Was it your dad? Um, or yeah. was there something else that pushed you in that direction? Well, initially I did want to be a, a medical doctor and I ended up changing when I realized I didn't want to just prescribe medicine. Not that that's a just, that's a big thing, but I didn't mm -hmm. see that as my calling anymore. Um, and I started mm -hmm. thinking about other things. And then I remembered actually an experience when my mom had a ruptured disc and she was not able to walk. She was in bed for a while. She was in so much pain. And I do remember her going to physical therapy and how that enabled her to get stronger and to return to her life as teacher, wife, mom. And so mm -hmm. I did um, some volunteer hours at Loma Linda observing a physical therapist. And it was so empowering for me just to realize how you can impact someone's mobility and their life and their mm -hmm. quality of life. So that's when mm -hmm. I discovered that, yeah, I would love to do something like this that's a little bit more active, more personal. Um, mm -hmm. And that's how I knew when I did that volunteer um, internship or the affiliation at Loma Linda, just really seeing it at mm -hmm. work. Um, so that was when I knew that I wanted to yeah. be a physical therapist. There are so many guests that I've had who have said similarly to you that it was when they had an opportunity to kind of get their hands dirty or to get involved in some way with with the area of study that they were interested in that really helped to solidify. It's not enough. I mean, it's one thing. Book knowledge is one thing, but it's getting those real world experiences that can really make a difference in helping you to know what your thing is. It was it was one particular moment. It wasn't even just because it was a two week observational period at Loma Linda. I was observing mm -hmm. inpatient physical therapy. So these are people in the hospital. Many of them can't walk, all of that. And I remember watching a physical therapist one day. He went in to treat a woman who was no longer able to move on her own. Um, she lost the control of her muscles. And so he went into the room and he was doing just passive range of motion moving her legs, stretching her, just getting her body moving. But she did have control of her hands and she had some mm -hmm. sort of device in which she could write on and she wrote on it, just thank you. And tears started oh. coming down her eyes. And I was just like, oh, wow. oh my gosh, this the movement is, is life. And yeah. so I, knew, I was like, wow, I want to be able to give that to someone. Um, and so oh. that's when I was like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to do this. And it was that moment yeah. that told me that this is the path. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm wondering if your dad, I know he's a personal trainer, does does that did that have any influence in the in your interest in movement and activity, you think? Um, not consciously. He's definitely big mm -hmm. on movement, health, fitness, but I yeah. don't think that it did. Maybe it maybe it did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I don't think that it did. Yeah. Yeah. It just it sounds it seems ironic to me that you would be, you know, so interested in, in that kind of activity when it's it is similar to what your dad does, you know, and that is. you it know, getting much. people moving and yeah. 
Yeah. And he works with um, um, clients that are paralyzed and everything. So you're right. It, it, there is some interconnection there. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously it wasn't conscious, but it makes sense. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm interested in, and, and, I, and I love uh, physical therapy. I know I have benefited from it myself for various ailments. And, you know, I really, I love the sort of natural, you know, approach to healing that it is mm -hmm. in my mind, it's part of. And so I'm curious to know how, physical therapy in general is, uh, compares to your, when you say you transition to more, um, you know, one that is more particular to women, women's therapy, women's, you know, for physical therapy for women. What is that shift? What is that difference? The shift really is not necessarily a shift in what we do, but a shift in the place that we do it. So when you go to a physical therapist, typically you're getting seen for your shoulder, your low back, your ankle, areas that are uh, seen by the public eye. Um, mm -hmm. But when you go to a pelvic physical therapist or a women's health physical therapist, um, we're focusing more on, on the pelvis itself and the mm -hmm. intimate functions of the pelvis. So in that sense, it's just a little bit more intimate. So now we're not just mm -hmm. talking about, can you reach above the cabinet or can you bend over without pain? It's are you able to control your bladder? Are you able to have sex mm -hmm. without having pain? Are you having constipation? And what are the muscles doing around the rectum and that mm -hmm. sort of thing? So it's just a way more specific, way more intimate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but it's yeah. still physical therapy because we want to normalize their movement and their function so that they can live their life. Wow, that's so interesting. So what led you to that specialty? I found out about women's health physical therapy when I was in school, but it was just a snippet. It was just like, hey, this is what it is. This is like one little course. And I was like, that's strange, but that sounds kind of interesting. That's yeah. very weird. Like, wow, we do that? Yeah. Um, but you know, when I got done with school, I was just trying to get a job. I mean, this, you know, I'm not about to tell someone, hey, only hire me here. I needed to yeah. just start working. Um, so I eventually got into traveling physical therapy, which I absolutely mm -hmm. love. It was great. Mm -hmm. Much mm -hmm. more money, much more flexibility. I saw different parts of the country, all of that. And then my recruiter told me about a position with women's health physical therapy. And I was like, mm -hmm. please put my application in for that. Um, yeah. She told me, though, that you needed experience to treat urinary incontinence, you know, to treat someone who's urinating every 10, 15 minutes, you have to have like some level of experience with that. And mm -hmm. I didn't have it, but I told her that I was a quick learner. <laughs> you know, you just talk mm -hmm. yourself up when you want a position. <laughs> yes, yeah. I am a quick learner. I'm good with people. <laughs> and um, so I did that and they gave me a chance and I was only supposed to be there for three months, but I kept renewing my contract because I enjoyed it that much. I ended up staying for a year. And oh, wow. um, that after that year, I said, okay, I need to go ahead and specialize now instead of just being mm -hmm. a physical therapist. I want to specialize mm -hmm. in pelvic physical therapy or formerly known as women's health physical therapy. Um, and mm -hmm. that's what opened up the door. And wow. here I am still doing it and treating yeah. mental conditions, pelvic health conditions. That is so interesting. So the place where you got your start, was it a, a, a place that, that specialized in women's health or did it, was it just that they needed someone to specialize in that for the patients who were coming in needing that type of therapy? Yeah, so it was a hospital uh, affiliated company in Oakland, California. And they had a lot of general physical therapists, but they also had pelvic physical therapists there. And there was okay. one pelvic therapist that went on maternity leave. So they needed someone oh. to come in and take her spot while she was gone. So that was what I was doing there. Um, okay. And that's when I realized, okay, this is the area of physical therapy that I actually enjoy. Mm -hmm. most. So yeah. it's been, she wrote ever since. So I'm, I'm, I'm so fascinated by this because I'm curious to know how unique is this specialty? Is it is it something that only a, a small percentage of physical therapists specialize in? Yeah, and it's relative. It's definitely small. I mean, not that many people want to do a vaginal muscle assessment or not that many people are <laughs> going to want to do an anal muscle assessment. Like it's not, 
Even sometimes yeah. when I go to work, I'm like, oh, I'm tired of looking at vulvas and vaginas. I just want to be a shoulder today, you know? Sometimes it is like that. So, you know, it gets tired. You know, you got to have them take off their clothes and all this. So it, it is a small percentage, but it's growing. That's why I say it's relative. It's the awareness mm -hmm. is really becoming more common. So there's more mm -hmm. students interested in pelvic physical therapy. And the word mm -hmm. is getting out there that there is physical therapy for constipation. There's physical therapy for pee in your pants. There's physical therapy for pelvic pain and vaginal pain and all of that. So um, the word is getting out. But yes, it, it's still very much unheard of. Like most people are just right. like, what? Something right. funny? Right. Like I'm listening to you talk about it. And I'm like, I never knew there was a thing that was a thing. And it's certainly yeah. not something that people are, are, are anxious to talk about. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to physical therapy for incontinence. So exactly. there's also that. Yeah. So yeah. I'm assuming then that you, the, the who you the patients you're seeing are those that maybe have been trying other things for these ailments or these issues. And then maybe we're eventually referred to you or I mean is anyone walking in there going hey <laughs> I need this kind of therapy so I have patients that come in they don't even know why they're there they're they're that I disconnected from pelvic physical therapy so the way it works where I am employed I work at a hospital with urogynecologists so similar to OBGYNs but they also focus more on bladder health too and so they'll usually refer to me. We're in the same building, same hallway. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. you may go in for maybe burning with urination or urinary incontinence or postpartum. You tore after you delivered mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And then they'll refer that patient to us. So that's mm -hmm. the way we get our patients at Northwestern. But a lot of other places get direct referrals or you can just walk mm -hmm. in directly find them mm -hmm. online, but the majority is that you tell your medical doctor that you're mm -hmm. having certain symptoms. Ideally, the doctor would refer you to us, but there's still so many doctors that are not. They're just saying, oh, well, you have pain with sex, drink some wine. You know, mm -hmm. you have, you have very, very honest. it's just part of being a woman. So it's still a lot of education mm -hmm. that needs to happen even in the midst of healthcare professionals. Um, but yeah. we're getting there. That's interesting. I'm I, I'm interested in that that gender disparity in healthcare, where you have the medical profession who, that is really devaluing in a way this kind of healthcare. Like th they're not teaching you much about it in school. They, you know, it's a passing chapter in the book. It's uh, right. the doctors male doctors i'm sure often are like oh you know it's just part of being a woman so i'm i'm sensing that in this specialty that you have that's the kind of experience you're having where women's health is not being made a priority oh absolutely i mean for example mm -hmm. post, the postpartum period is one of the most neglected period uh periods in a woman's life you know they're pregnant mm -hmm. for nine months they give birth and then they have one appointment schedule that says six week follow up and then that's it. Mm -hmm. It's like go mm -hmm. go into the wild and they're yeah. so vulnerable. You know, their hormones are all over the place. They've made the biggest transition of going from just woman to now mother, going through yeah. those identity changes. Their breasts are now pumping milk machines. I mean, it's just so yeah. many different things that happen. Yeah. And um, that's just one example of a neglected period. There's also the period of like going into menopause and mm -hmm. women are laughing about, oh, you pee your pants when you sneeze. Oh, yeah, me too. But that's not normal. That's not right. something that is healthy. But because it's yeah. so common and kind of like hush, hush, right. um, there's not a lot of people that know that that can be treated. So yes. it is the work to do. Which is why you're here to talk to us about what help is out there. And so for the audience or those of you who are watching and you hear some of the symptoms that she's talking about, uh, I'm not going to ask you to, to, to self-identify in the comments. Don't worry. But <laughs> but let's talk about some of those things that women may be dealing with that they don't know or don't realize that it can be that can be treated. And can you talk about 
what you do for for incontinence, what you do for those for the the woman who's had a delivery and, and torn down there. Like, what is what does that therapy look like, and what are some of the results that you're able to get from those therapies? Yeah. So when someone comes in, you know, of course, it's I want to know all about how you've been doing. You know, what are the symptoms that you've been having? What are the things that you've noticed? What is frustrating you? And that really forms the basis of what I'm going to be um, examining and almost expecting, but I won't be sure until I do like the actual pelvic uh, assessment. So I'm going to be looking at posture. I'm going to be looking at range of motion. I'm going to be looking at, you know, here, where is their pain? You know, is there pain right at the vaginal opening or is there pain um, closer to the anus? And then inside of the pelvic floor, that's the main assessment part that really gives me the most information about this muscle group is their tightness. And that's a big myth that a lot of people think vaginal tightness is like, oh my gosh, your vagina is tight. You're so amazing. And that's not, that's actually not good. <laughs> so of course we're not, you know, I'm not encouraging that the vagina be like this, of course, that's not normal. But for it to be tense and it can't relax well, like there's less mobility in that muscle, that creates mm -hmm. issues. Constipation, mm -hmm. urinary frequency, urgency, that feeling that you're not going to make it to the bathroom without like peeing mm -hmm. on yourself. Um, mm -hmm. It can cause pelvic pain and painful periods. So many different things um, mm -hmm. that it can cause. And if you think about it, you know, there's no muscle in the body that we want to be tight. Like no one goes around saying, I want a tight neck. I want tight calf muscles. Like <laughs> it's not, it's not functional, nor is it logical. So yeah. naturally, there is that tone in the vagina. That's just how it's made. It's elastic. It stretches to conform to whatever's inside, and then it goes back. But beyond just that normal level of tone, it shouldn't be tense. And a lot of women that I see are actually too tense and not weak. Mm. So mm. that's something that we work on: relaxing that pelvic floor strengthening the surrounding muscles so that pelvic floor can relax um mm -hmm. training them on different behaviors that actually tie into their vaginal health like coffee intake and alcohol and um you know how much sleep they're getting at night and how they're mm -hmm. sitting like how they're holding their pelvis when they're sitting it's a lot of different things that we that we work on but it's very similar to regular physical therapy the area mm -hmm. is just different but we use the same mm. massage, exercises, behavior, posture, some of those same mm -hmm. things. So interesting. Yeah. So no one would probably imagine that uh, what they eat or drink would have some effect on their vagina. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's a great uh, thing to bring up. So the vagina is a muscle. And I think that that's something to always remember that just like you have biceps and you have quads and you have calf muscles, the vagina is a muscle too. And also the pelvic floor. So just something as simple as like drinking coffee, you know, that's going to stimulate your bladder more. You're going to be peeing a lot more. You might even have a little bit of urinary leakage if you have an issue with that. Um, so there are bladder irritants that can cause your pelvic floor muscles to become a little bit too stimulated. Um, mm -hmm. Let's say we're not eating enough fiber, we're not eating enough plants, then we're, we're gonna mm -hmm. be straining to poop. We're gonna mm -hmm. be pushing more. And that's gonna mm -hmm. weaken the muscles inside of the pelvis and also the muscles around the vagina too. So that can mm -hmm. weaken the vagina and lead to something called prolapse. And that's when one of the pelvic organs starts to come out of the vaginal opening. It looks like that like maybe mm. a ball or a bulge that you feel like something is coming out of your vagina. So you're, what you're eating, oh my gosh, it's huge. Mm. Um, mm. So they, I think they just posted um, the cover for my vagina food e-guide. And mm. I talk about 50 foods for your vagina. I mean, we get into foods that can help you strengthen your immune system. Maybe if you have recurrent UTIs or maybe if you have an STD, we get into mm -hmm. foods that can help with menopause. We get into foods that can help with vaginal dryness. Um, mm -hmm. I, I really try to tackle a lot of the major conditions that we struggle with. 
because food is our is our ally. I mean, it's really mm -hmm. a weapon in, in the mm -hmm. toolbox of a woman. If we're eating two to three times a day, you better believe what you're eating is going to impact your life. Awesome. That that is that is good information. And what are what are some of the exercises that you have your patients do? Particularly, let's say the common one is probably incontinence. Let's say if that's one of the issues that a woman ha is having, what are some of the exercises that you might have her do for that? Well, it would depend on what's causing the incontinence. So if someone is peeing their pants, their, their muscles could be too tense. They could be too weak, which means they're not firing well or they're not firing with enough force. Or they could be uncoordinated. It's like their muscles can contract, but they don't contract at the right time. So I mm. might include exercises to start working on their abdominal uh, strength because the mm. pelvic floor actually contracts with the abdomen. So we want to mm. look at the abdominal wall and work on some um, some core strengthening. Sometimes it's actually relaxing the belly because a lot of mm. women hold their belly in and that's actually putting more pressure on your pelvic floor and that can weaken your vagina and your muscles too. So sometimes relax relaxation exercises yoga poses like um, child's pose or happy baby or mm -hmm. um, exercises to lengthen out your hips and your low back. So those mm -hmm. are some of the exercises, but it really depends on what I find on the exam to guide mm -hmm. what type of exercise I would give them. Got you. So what kinds of responses do you get from people when they hear about your specialty? Um. <laughs> A lot of disbelief, shock, like, wow, I didn't know that was a thing. I didn't know that existed. Or I didn't, how do I find one? <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> a big one. It's like, well, how do I get a pelvic physical therapist? Do I just go straight in? Does the doctor, yeah. like, how do I get into this? Um, that's a big yeah. question. Also, just a lot of people that are interested to learn, even if they may not have an active issue, just learning yeah. more. Uh, wow, we have some control over these muscles. Um, yeah. so it's a bit of, of all three, just curiosity, shock, and wanting to yeah. know how to get started. Are there common misconceptions about the work that you do? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, one of the biggest ones is that all we do is teach people how to Kegel. <laughs> and they're just like, <laughs> so what do you do aside from just Kegel? And I'm just like, many times, <laughs> We don't even do Kegeling at all because, like I said, there's so many women mm. that have too much tension. Their muscles mm. are so stiff. It's like they can squeeze a little bit, but when they try and relax that muscle, the muscles don't even move. So I would mm. not dare give them more Kegels because that's just going to tighten and constrict even more. And, mm -hmm. and so that's a big misconception that we only do Kegels. But we're also <laughs> looking at their movement. We're looking at their diaphragm, how they breathe. We're looking at how they hold their, their shoulders. We're looking at the position of their pelvis. We're trying to strengthen mm -hmm. their butt. A lot of people have weak butts. <laughs> We're doing a lot of a lot of the things well beyond Floyd. So I would say that's probably yeah. one of the biggest misconceptions. I have to say that was the first thing I thought about, you know, when you're talking about strengthening the pelvic floor. We, you know, all yeah. women know, oh, eagle, that's what you have to do. Yeah. So yeah. But it's not really functional, though. Like, yeah. you don't naturally just throughout the day just randomly start kegeling unless someone told you to do that. But throughout mm -hmm. the day when you move, your pelvic floor is engaging with your abdominal wall, with your back mm -hmm. muscles. You're stabilizing. You're doing a lot of different things. So kegels can sometimes help. But by themselves, mm -hmm. just doing kegels, it's not all that functional. So mm. we, we use it many times to maybe activate the pelvic floor and get it turned on because it's been, a lot of women are disconnected from that area of their body. They don't even know how to do a Kegel correctly. So we mm. might use that to get a, some level of strengthening, some level of like turning on that muscle group, but mm -hmm. it's, it's not that central to, to pelvic physical therapy. Mm. So how uncomfortable are your patients typically when they first come to you? Is, is it, do you have to do some work of kind of getting them comfortable with, with the conversation about that area of their body? You said women are often very disconnected from 
that part yeah. of their body and, and probably are uncomfortable even talking about it and having yeah. you look down there. Right. <laughs> Gratefully, <laughs> most people are fed up with whatever's going on. So uh, they're at a point where they want help. They don't want to pee on mm -hmm. themselves anymore. They're tired of having pain with sex. Um, they don't mm -hmm. like running to the bathroom all the time. You know, mm -hmm. so different things, I think, bring them to the place where they're now ready. Um, mm -hmm. I think maybe initially people go through a phase of like, oh, this is going to go away on its own or I don't really want to talk about this. But generally, mm -hmm. once they get into my office, um, they're they're comfortable at least talking about it. Gratefully, I talk to them first before just going into the internal vaginal exam. So we mm -hmm. talk for about 30 minutes. So I think that time mm -hmm. gets warmed up. Um, I don't want to take yeah. my heart. But I think I have a good personality. So I, I try <laughs> to warm, I try to warm them up and get them comfortable, yeah. you know, make them laugh. Um, you know, yeah. break the ice a little bit so they're more comfortable. And even if someone isn't, I don't have to do that internal exam on the first day. I can say, yeah. we'll look at your posture, I'll check your hip strength, I'll look at a lot of other stuff. And then next yeah. week, let's say stop doing it. But I would say yeah. 90% of the people that I see. You know, they've seen an OBGYN before, you know, they know why they're mm -hmm. there most of the time. And so they're typically open to it when I explain why it's necessary to do it. Right. And right. so usually that's enough to get them open to the idea. Got you. That's that's good. So I'm, I'm curious to know, we talked, we started off talking about your relationship with your mom and your upbringing and all the things she taught you growing up. How much of what you know now uh, it was a surprise to you once you learned that there were things that, you know, your mom didn't tell you. <laughs> well, you know, our moms didn't tell us a lot about the vagina. So <laughs> I think, you know, I don't, I guess when I'm learning something, it, it never really goes back to, oh, my mom never told me that because let's just be honest to a certain extent, you don't really talk about that sort of thing, you know, with your mom, maybe like how to wash your vagina and, maybe don't have sex if you're Christian, you know, but we don't really go into detail that much. So I guess in my mind, when I'm learning these different things, I don't really take it back to that, but it would have been nice. It would have been nice to help to hear just more of my mom's experiences because of course not every mom is going to know the scientific explanation or the medical stuff, but like, you know, how did you experience this? How did you go about this? And what happened when you did so and so, or did you do? You know, right. just move that would have been nice, but it didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so here I am, but I don't feel like jaded, or I don't feel like you know I wasn't yeah. equipped to to deal with womanhood or you know managing my vaginal health. Um, but I think that's changing going forward for the generations mm -hmm. to come, and even this generation. Um, we seem to be a little bit more open with discussing vaginal, pelvic health, sexual health. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, absolutely. I, I wouldn't expect the average mom to be talking about the things that you do with your patients. <laughs> Clearly. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Kim. I said I'm laughing because they're showing the TikTok. And you know the TikTok is different from the Instagram. <laughs> so I'm just <laughs> laughing. I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Um, it's a little bit more laid back, a little bit more laid back on that one. Um, Got you. We'll, we'll, we'll let uh, people find your TikTok on their own and they can take a look at some of your videos. <laughs> yeah, we're sorry, Kim. Go ahead. No, no, it's fine. No, I, I, I was just saying, obviously, we're not expecting the average mom to know or have the level of knowledge that you do with your specialty, of course. But to your point, most moms are not that comfortable even talking about that area of our body, which is, I think, why a lot of adult women who finally come to you are, you know, unable to really even tell you what they're what they're dealing with. Really, mm -hmm. are able to articulate that because it, it is something that we typically in our culture are sort of we shy away from talking about. So uh, I was just I was I guess just asking from your experience now, thinking back to your upbringing. What were those areas of that were that were not your your own mother wasn't comfortable talking about that maybe now people talk about more or are more comfortable talking about? Um, I would say we definitely didn't really talk about it, just like overall like 
grooming or hair removal. You know, that wasn't really something discussed. Um, and I think that's a common question that I get from a lot of people. It's like, am I supposed to remove hair down there? Am I supposed to keep it? What are the best, best ways to get rid of it? Um, and so that wasn't really something that was discussed. That was discussed amongst my friends. Um, yeah. And I, I think it's a light bulb moment for parents when you realize you might not be talking about it, but they're going to be talking about it with their friends or learning it from, dare say, social media or pornography. I, I hate to bring it there. Yeah. But it is yeah. true. And we really yeah. need our parents and the church to be a little bit more open discussing things beyond just what not to do because right. they're going to be getting way more exposure from unprofessional, unchristian right. um, sources that, that don't really help, mm -hmm. <laughs> that don't really right. help. Um, and so, yeah, that was one area, like just grooming, um, of course, sex. I mean, aside from wait till marriage, that wasn't discussed yeah. <laughs> at yeah. all. And it's okay. I'm not, I don't, the thing is for me, I don't have like hard feelings because yeah. I never felt like I, if I did go to her, she would say, no, let's not talk about it. I did mm -hmm. feel comfortable asking about different things, but I guess at that time I didn't even think to ask because those right. conversations were just not happening <laughs> with your right. mom at that level. Um, yeah. She told me about cleanliness and like, you know, menstrual cycle hygiene and stuff, which I'm thankful for. Yeah. Like, with using a pad and you know changing a tampon and that we definitely right. talked about that. Um, yeah, and taking a shower. Yeah, she told me to bathe. Yes, <laughs> as, a, as any good mom would. Huh? <laughs> I said, as any good mother would. She taught you how to yeah. bathe yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was the extent of it. But I didn't think it was strange yeah. because it just wasn't really happening. You know, in right. other scenarios. You know, I didn't hear of my friends having these conversations with their mom. So I wasn't like, oh, right. my mom is just not a good mother. She doesn't tell me about no. the job. You know, it just wasn't happening. Right. So definitely. Yeah. But I think that the more we know, the more comfortable we are with, with sharing. So those of us who are mothers, the more knowledge we have, the more we could pass on to our children. And so I think a lot of mothers just taught their own daughters from their own experiences and the level, you know, the extent of the knowledge that they had. And, and so I, I guess, as you're saying, in the generations that come, as we know more, as we are able to educate ourselves on these kinds of things, then we can, of course, pass them on to our children. And, and yeah. then too, there may be things that we will always learn from our peers rather than our parents just because mm -hmm. of that level of confidence that we may have with girlfriends right. as opposed to, you know, parents. Yeah. So there's no shade at all, but you know, this month's theme is all the things our moms didn't tell us. So, right. um, you I know, think, it's, it's, I, I was going to say, I think as well, there might be a little bit of a fear of if I go into too much detail, I'm pushing them to go into their sexuality mm -hmm. too early, or I'm pushing them to start thinking about their vagina too early. I think there is a little mm -hmm. bit of that, of like, yeah. let's not open their eyes to these things too early. Let them be kids. And, you know, these right. areas where we want to shield our children and protect our children, um, that's great, but to a point that just becomes, you know, lack of knowledge at to a certain right. point. So yeah. I, I think that there's that where the parents are, are meaning well, and they're just like, well, they're going to learn about this eventually. Why do I have to start talking about this? You know? Right. So I think maybe that's impacting it, uh, the conversation as well, or the lack of conversation. For sure. Oh yeah, for sure. So I have a, a daughter, I have two daughters and they're four years apart. And I remember when I had to tell my oldest about minstrels and all the things that go with it, her younger sister was kind of around. And, and I realized that I, I was gonna have to tell her younger sister some things probably earlier than I would have liked to, just because she was right there as her sister was going through it. And right. there was a sense of, oh man, I'm, I'm, you know, taking away her innocence because I have to sort of expose yeah. her to this exactly. information. And 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 even her was even well, both of them actually, both of their responses was like, oh no, don't tell me, I don't want to know. You yeah. know, they they didn't want to even you know go there. So yeah, it's it's it's. It is what it is, but it, it, you know you have it's to. Yeah, yeah, there's layers to this yeah. thing, and so it's difficult to yeah. navigate. Yeah, for sure.
for sure. So I'm, I'm definitely wanting you to share how moms and women in general can, can get this information for themselves, potentially even to share with their children or their daughters as they're growing up. What information do you have out there? We've seen your website. I know you have the e-guide. Anything else that you need to share so that people know how to get this information? So I think the best way to learn is when you are engaged. And for me, I engage my audience the best through Instagram because I use reels that are entertaining. And so mm -hmm. I find that the best way to capture someone's attention. Once I grab someone in with the with the uh, reel, the, the reel is usually <laughs> funny. And then the caption has all of the education. And so mm -hmm. I, I love to just shoot people over there because it's quick. It's a fun way to learn and you can easily share it or save it for references. Um, so that's the number one way. The second way is, is uh, my website. So vaginarehabdoctor.com is where I keep everyone updated on upcoming vaginal fitness classes. I try to have a class once a month. I call them Vag Stretch Labs. Um, and so usually the first Sunday of the month, we get together for 30 minutes to an hour and we do exercises, movements um, for vaginal fitness and pelvic floor fitness. So strengthening, relaxing, stretching, really investing in your pelvic floor muscles because that area is typically ignored. So mm -hmm. that's what that's all about. Um, and of course, we already talked about the Vagina Food E-Guide. That's just something that can be of, a, of resource to you um, mm -hmm. when you're growing shopping or, you know, doing some cooking in the house. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much. So quick question. What does your mom think about what you're doing now? I'm sure she's proud of you. Um, was she surprised when you told her what your specialty was going to be? Like um, many people I'm sure were. I can't really <laughs> remember a surprise moment because I always had that interest from even physical therapy school. So I don't uh -huh. really remember the surprise moment, but Every now and then she's like, Janelle, you know, you don't have to say vagina in public or, you know, <laughs> just things like that. But overall, she's extremely supportive. I mean, even sometimes when I just want to take a break from posting about vaginas, she's like, this is an opportunity, you know, try to get into that clinic and share, you know. So she's a very she's a motivating force for me. Yeah. Um, sometimes she, she thinks I'm a little bit over the top, like, <laughs> Remember, you don't want to offend people and you have older people in the right. crowd and different things like that. Right. But she, she's comfortable with it now. She tells her friends. I mean, she's a really big cheerleader for me. So I'm, I'm thankful. Yeah. For that. Yeah. That's good. She is. In fact, she's the one that shared with me that you had this book out and uh, it started me down the path of looking into what you had going on. So, yeah, yeah. she's a good mom. <laughs> I think she's the one that, con that connected us for this. Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So she's always she's finding more work for me to do. She's she's <laughs> giving me work assignments. That's my mom. <laughs> That's your mom. Yep. <laughs> True to form. Well, I'm I'm certainly glad that she introduced us because this is super interesting to me. I think it's it's wonderful that you have found this niche that is so needed. And uh, I want to do what I can to make people know what's out there, what's available, particularly women, because I know that our health so often isn't prioritized either by us yeah. or the health profession in general. So very important that we have this information, that we are our own advocates. And I hope that those who are watching will connect with you if they need it. So, and I'll continue following and, and take a look at some of your resources also. So thank you again for being here. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And everybody who watched, drop some love. Make sure you like the Hey Girl page and you know, big shout out to Kim for having me um, on here. Um, if you do not remember, my name is Vagina Rehab Doctor, the same name on Instagram and TikTok, and the same for my website, vaginarehabdoctor.com. So thanks for having me, and hopefully I can come back again. I hope so, too. That would be great. And I doubt very seriously that anyone will forget you. That name is certainly memorable. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So true. <laughs> 
So we're going to go now to our scripture before we close. And I chose 1 Corinthians 15, 40, which says there are heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies. The splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. And I think that's so appropriate for our conversation today, because really what we're talking about is our body. Our physical body is something beautiful that God created and he wants it to work well. And so if there's some part of our body that isn't working well, why not find out how to fix it and how better to fix it than with the natural remedies, with good health, good diet and exercise and what a wonderful resource that Dr. Howell is to us as women uh, that we can really connect with what's going on with our bodies and figure out how to make it better. I'm so glad that you joined us today for this, this very important conversation. And I hope that you will continue to join us the rest of this month as we continue to share the kinds of information that maybe we're not accustomed to talking about, but we certainly need to. Be your own advocate and take care of your body. I look forward to seeing you again next week. Our special guest will be Micah Logan, who is going to talk to us about how she survived breast cancer. And in particular, how she was able to learn from her experience, something that her mother certainly couldn't teach her. I hope you'll be here with us next week. I look forward to seeing you soon. Hey girl, you know, moms are great, but there's some things we have to learn on our own. From our bodies to our money, this month is all about getting answers to the questions we never thought to ask. Join us Saturdays at five on Facebook Live.